Hello and welcome to the Hurling Show on Off The Ball. We're here every Friday talking about the ancient game. Uh, you can follow us on YouTube, Facebook and uh, Twitter, of course. Uh, send us in any comments you have, any questions you might have, and we'll, uh, we'll get to them if we definitely can. In studio this week, as always, is Michael Verney, ex Offaly hurler and, of course, independent writer. How are you doing? Good, Shane. Yeah, no good, yet. Yeah, and the... Uh the odd one out this week, I suppose, is the, the Stapleton show this week. So yeah, I've, uh, I've nepotism is alive and well. I have my brother. I, I, it'll never, there's never a fear of nepotism leaving the GA. No, first. no, no, no. So my brother Paddy Stapleton, who played for Tipperary for ten years, is going to join us on the line as well. Before we get to Paddy, first thing, last weekend another brilliant weekend of hurling. Tipperary turning around a nine point deficit to come back. Unfortunately, you were at Offaly against Wexford and saw your your uh, your county pretty much destroyed and leaves them reeling for this weekend's relegation clash with Dublin. Yeah, it was it was as bad as it's been in a while to be honest with you because the game was over after 15 or 20 minutes and you, ju you just knew like a half time you were just kind of knew what you're going to have to endure during the whole of the second half like it was yeah it was it was tough going there's there so many kind of subplots over the weekend wasn't there between like Tipperary coming back from the dead and Waterford Waterford nearly looked dead already with all the injuries and now the Offaly Dublin game this weekend coming in yeah it's just there's uh, so many different plots every every week and we haven't even mentioned the fact that Galway destroyed yeah. Kenny and bullied them off the park as well and we will get to that this weekend um, on Off the Ball we'll, we'll have coverage at all the games we'll have Oshin Langan at Wexford Galway we'll have Dave McIntyre at Cork Limerick uh, Dahi Regan at Dublin Offaly and uh, Jamesy and O'Sheen Langan will be at Watford Tipperary as well. Um, I'm not sure if Paddy is ready on the line there. Paddy, how are you doing? Not too bad. How are you? Not too bad. What are you up to there? Are you just out of school? Just finished for the summer now. Very so good. We, yeah. This is like two boys having a chat over breakfast back in the day now. Well, well how are you today? You were in my was not too long ago, Harley. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you were, you were in UL, UL together, got to... Fitz final or no, Michael? You were gone by the time yeah. Paddy won the Fitz. Yeah, right? we played we played a Fitz final before Paddy came in, and then I think we were beaten in semi final, and then I was a year oh, gone. I was a year gone when the boys got over the line. Unfortunately, that probably says a lot in itself. It was a telling change. Yeah. Yeah. Common denominator. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Paddy was it? Was he much of a mouthpiece in the dressing room? Uh, well, you definitely a mouthpiece anyway. You definitely hear him before you see him. <laughs> so, so we, in fairness, we had great crack, and uh, we kind of we bottled that. Uh, semi-final definitely that year we, uh, who were we playing WIT and Timmy Hammersley and Boogie O'Mara I think put pay to us but um, and we were close alright but yeah unlucky unlucky Bernie <laughs> I, was on, I was on the bench you, you were more unlucky on the field to be honest with you but, uh, so, so just looking ahead to this weekend the first game we're going to look at is Tipperary against Waterford and by your, your, your career with Tipperary probably a lot of it coincided with games against Waterford. Um, your debut was as a blood sub in the 2008 semi-final against Waterford, which is the last time Waterford beat Tipperary under Davy Fitz. Um, can you tell us some of your experiences of, of playing against Waterford? There was the 2010 All-Ireland semi-final as well, the 2011 mm. Munster uh, final against uh, Waterford as well down in Cork. Yeah, that's your luck. As, as odd, like most teams, you have some great games against them, and we did. But I personally, I suppose... I had a great day. My first day was playing against them, uh, coming on as blood sub, and I remember buzzing. But I, I came on as blood sub, but I didn't know I was coming on, um, and I wasn't really warmed up. But I was only on for five minutes, and and I nearly had a heart attack when I get back on the bench. So I had to lie down when I got back onto the bench. So I think for forevermore when I was when I was a sub, I started to go down and do my own warm up because um, I'd I'd be a bit asthmatic, and went in and I was horsing around the place. You know, tension high. Your first ever game. And I swear to God, I thought I was going to faint on the sideline afterwards. So that was a nice, we lost the game now, which is, that wasn't, that was a negative. That was maybe when Watford got hammered, we, we could have been lucky not to win that match because Kilkenny were really at their, um, at their peak. And then 2010 then was um, really the game where I suppose we started really believing we could win the All-Ireland because we battled against Galway, great game. And then... Um, and then we just got over the line, they could have beat us. And then uh, kind of hammered Waterford in the semi-final. But um, I didn't go great myself that day, but look, we got over the line. Yeah, tell us, and, and actually you mentioned the, the asthmatic. Uh, a lot of the high achievers in sport tend to be asthmatic, but we won't go too far down that road. But can you tell us about the 2011 Munster final and preparing to mark John Milan, who was at the height of his powers back then? Um, what year? 2010? 2011, I think, the Munster, oh, Munster final. Jeez, yeah, yeah. So that, that was a good day for us, but um, I, uh, it never happened to me before, and it's not happened to me since, but I, um, I couldn't sleep that night. I just couldn't. I knew I was going to have to mark John Milan, and he's the, only, he's the only player that I really felt I was like, I, I could be under serious pressure here because 
they played it in a way that there was 40 yards of space all around him and nobody really, nobody in the full forward line got a pass, only him. So um, he's, he has space to go left, right and then you're trying to get out in front of him but the ball is measured in so you can't read it and then you're trying to maybe balk him but he's too fast and he was stronger than me and taller than me <laughs> and a better hurler, obviously a better hurler and so I just, I just, you know, I was, I knew what was ahead of me, but um, so I middle of the, middle of the night, I, I turned turn on the lamp and I just like, what? How am I going to get sleep? So I, I heard like I'm not huge. I like sports psychology, but I'm not massively into doing too much. I do my own stuff, but um, I wrote down a few things that I try and do the next day, uh, three or four little things uh, to try and settle myself down. So got to sleep, and lo and behold, it was the one day he didn't score too much on me, um, and it all worked out happily ever after. Yeah. But, uh, I remember you, nice. give, you give away a few frees, but uh, tell me about what were the three or four things you wrote down? And I remember you telling me afterwards when Kieran McGinney came in and was involved, he did a bit of sports psychology with you too. But first of all, tell us about the three or four things that you, you might have wrote down before that game at Waterford. Um, well, it definitely was uh, the number one thing, and it's for years because I, I, like Liam Sheedy was training me under 16 anyway for North Tip or Tipperary or something, but he was thinking it was also to be out front. Now, it was impossible at Milan at times, but out in front, I remember that was definitely one to get out in front because um, that's always the big thing you want to do. And then to hold him up when he gets the ball. big thing about Milan is he actually wants to pull you in when he was playing, He'd pull you into the tackle, and then you'd be on the ground with him like that. And I, I did foul him a good bit, and I, I pride myself in not fouling as much, but it was just impossible. And he'd pull you into And if, if he couldn't pull in, if you kept him away, he'd just keep running. So either way, you're kind of screwed. But um, that day, I was trying to keep him away from me, and uh, he got away a few times. But no, it, wasn't, it, it didn't end up too bad. But I can't remember right now, but there, there were two things I definitely, definitely remember. Mm. And just, you know, Tipperary started the season so poorly this year, losing by six points to Limerick, a fairly tepid display, and followed up that, uh, that league final loss to, to Kilkenny as well. The first half against Cork was very poor also. And, you know, you look at 2010 and you think that, you know, lost heavily to Cork, went on to win the All-Ireland and you were obviously on the team at the time. Um, but it wasn't a simple case that T Tipperary reloaded that year, went again. They, they trialled out some things and there was, a, there was a Waterford Challenge match and Tipperary tried something drastic that didn't quite work. So it's not a case that Liam Sheedy knew straight away after that Cork game, you know, what to do. There's a bit of trial and error as well. If you can explain that situation with Paddy Maher in the Challenge match with Waterford. Yeah, so we played them a couple of weeks later and um, definitely confidence was a bit low. Like we slept off through that whole league campaign and a little bit the way Tip have been playing for the last year until maybe the second half against Cork where it's, you know, the other team is always the aggressor. And that was the way it was. Cork just pushed us around the place down in Park of Cueve and lost by 10 points. Um, and I suppose, uh, I think Liam Sheedy just tried to freshen it up. He put guys in like Bonamaher and Grodd. Ryan were two lads getting their go, even though they hadn't seen any game time. Um, and you had Paddy Maher playing centre forward in the challenge game. And this kind of, uh, and I think had Shane McGrath was moving position as well. But like, to be honest, I was like, even at the time, I was kind of thinking this is mad stuff, you know, because there was a little question mark. It seems funny now, there was a bit of a question mark over Paddy at the time. Isaac Halpine got a few scores off him as a full back and... Then people had this, just because he was a big guy, thought, oh, sure, he can't play out the field, he's not able to move. So this thing of putting him up centre forward. But I think Liam Sheedy was just trying to switch the energy around, like maybe mix it up a little bit. Um, and eventually then, you know, sometimes not an exact science. Like you see, like Sir Richie Hogan has been switched over the years, corner forward and out midfield, didn't go well from back in and now he's out again. So uh, it's just trying to get that balance. And it's it's very hard to put on a piece of paper and measure it all out, you know, it's not, it's not a scientific formula, so it's just getting that, that thing right. And even Shane McGrath that year, Shane McGrath was put as a centre forward, wing, he was dropped, then in as a wing forward, centre forward. Then by the time he came back out playing midfield, he was like the Shane McGrath from 2007, 2008 again. So it just was a little mix and match, got the energy going again and got the juices flowing, I suppose. Mick, just talking about this current Watford team, or Tipperary team, you saw the switch at halftime, Ronan Maher went to midfield and Brendan Maher went wing back. Is, is Mike Ryan, and you know, he's changed the full back line a little bit, so, somewhat due to injury as well. Do you think he's slowly mutating towards the right starting 15 for Tipperary or is there, is there a bit to go yet? Yeah, it's funny on what Paddy said there. You can have what you think is the best 15 with lads in the best positions and then you go out and it's like what they say about uh, yeah, everyone has a plan until they get a box in the face. After 10 minutes, the, the full back switches with the centre back, the wing back switches with the corner back, the midfield goes wing forward. And it's kind of funny, like looking at the team that was picked the Friday night for the Limerick game, you're thinking, 
like how many changes are there going to be? By the time they find, by the time he finds what he thinks is the best combination, there's going to be some amount of change. He's, he's slowly getting there. And uh, what I like in the attack is like Seamus Callan last week. Like I think he got a point, did he? I think he yeah, got one score. Play, yeah. He worked so hard. He's gonna he's gonna come on some amount this weekend. It's like, it's like a horse having the first run of the season. Like they're gonna come on for the second run. He the balls didn't really bounce his way. It wasn't the sort of game that would sue him to get on the sc- on the score on the scoreboard, but. He worked so hard that he's going to come on. I think he's going to come on some out this weekend. It could be a completely different game, and he could rattle two goals this weekend. And I just think, yeah, Mick Ryan is finding kind of the combination that he wants. It's a slow kind of process, but at least if, if they can get over this weekend, they probably learn one or two new things again. And then for the, the the last week, and then probably if they get through, he'll have a fairer idea. And I just think last weekend, uh, it just reminded me of the qualifier, ga- qualifier game in 2014 that, that turned tip season around. While they didn't win last Sunday, I just think that was a lifeline for them. And it's amazing, like, lads can, will be, have so much energy as a result of that now. It, you, you can't really quantify that. They've been beaten by a point, deflated completely. They got a draw, they're still, they're still in it. Um, I think lads will be absolutely hopping this weekend. And they'll just see from half time of the court game, our season was over, to now where, like, get two wins and we're, we're back on the pigs back again. And Pat, just like look, you, you heard with Brendan Maher at club level, and he, uh, club level and he plays centre back for Boris Lee. Do you think uh, his best position is in the half back line for this Tipperary team? And within that, just Rona Maher went to midfield, but he only had the ball twice in his hand in the second half when Tip were well on top. So I'm not quite sure if he should also be in the half back line with Brendan and Paddy Maher. You probably need a bit of leadership in both lines. Um, you do need a, see, my theory is if you've quality players in either line, uh, as long as the team as a whole is working, those two players will play well in any position. I would be of the opinion if Ronan Maher was wing back or centre back in that second half, the way the forward line, Vernia said it with, with Seamus Callan, uh, and I'd echo that, he was brilliant leading the line. If the line is led like that every day, it won't matter. If Ronan Maher is centre back, Paddy Maher is wing back, vice versa, Brendan Maher is centre wing back midfield. I don't think it'll matter that much because they will be on the ball now. Maybe you'll stop the other team targeting pace around their half back line. That could be the thing that the other team won't think of doing that. But at the same time, if, if you have a hand or if you have uh, a couple of the quicker cock forwards, uh, Kingston and these, and they're getting quality ball in in front of the half back, like no half back is going to be able to deal with that. Bar he is really, really fast. And what you want is big, strong halfbacks that are able to attack the ball. And you'll only be able to attack the ball and play your game, which is sweeping and coming on to big deliveries down if the forward line are working well together and working smart and working hard. And for the first three halves of the, of the first two games, it just wasn't happening for them. And I know they probably think that they were doing everything in their power, but maybe it's a confidence thing. Lads were overthinking it, uh, thinking before they should have been gone. Because as you know yourself, at inter-county level, it only takes a split, kind of a few percentages to be off and they're getting hammered. And that's, that, that is the way it is because the other team are away. So I think either position is brilliant, wing back, very, very good midfielder. But I think either position is just, it's the whole team as a, as a chain, uh, as a unit. I think it's interesting what you said there. Um, we talked about like Tipperary's kind of ping pong, thirty yard kind of hurling, and that's kind of what you remember. But I was chatting to somebody and they said, just go back and have a look at the 2016 final and some of their scores that they got. And I looked at John McGrath's goal, for example, which was a hail mary ball into the forward line, actually, that they just turned over because they were chasing impacts. And a lot of the scores, when I looked back, were just sheer volume of work by three or four lads, and that's what they were at again the other day in the second half particularly around that middle third, they were just kind of ravenous. It was am- amazing to see. And even like if, if Paddy Maher flicked the ball out over the sideline, like, they were bullying. Like, it was just like everything was so on point again. And I think Paddy is right. The position is probably not as important when they're, when they're working, when they have that work rate down to the T like they had the second half the other day, things will just fall into place. And I think that's probably the biggest thing that they've learned. And we'll just, I think their attitude should change. I, I do have to wonder, though, why there wasn't a reaction in the first half. It, it's actually, when I think about it after the second half reaction, it's like they had to wait till half time to realise, geez, our season is over here if we don't do something. But it's amazing to think like, that they were 7 0 down, that there was actually no reaction from the Limerick game initially. Like, it was ma- a bit mad, actually. A bit, a bit wasteful up front, I would have said as well. Just, uh, I want to touch on the age issue because there was a lot of talk about Tip being perhaps over the hill, but 
when I crunch the numbers afterwards, the average age of the Cork team is 25.4 and the average age of the Tip team is 25.6. And I know there's a miles on the clock issue, but Cork had three lads over 30, Tip had none. So I think that's a little bit erroneous. Uh, it is a bit. The only thing I will say is, is that when you go down to the Tip team, Pace is like pace is so important in modern hurling. Christy, Christy O'Connor did a piece recently actually just about how important pace was and how it's nearly the, one of the most important skills now in the game. And Tip are not blessed with pace in a, in a lot of areas, particularly at the back. And that's why if you're a small bit off, it just shows up and like, to say that guys are, you know, pushing 30 or nearly over the hill is, is, is a bit mad, yeah. Like, Ronan Maher is pushing, pushing 30 and he's 23, like, do you know what I mean? Do you know what I mean? Like, but yeah, it's, it's funny like that. And it, it's, I was actually down with Tony Dorn yesterday in Wexford and he just said to me how he stayed hurling with Wexford till he was 38. And I just said, like, if you were hurling now, you do realise you would have been retired at 28, 29, every year people mm. would be asking, yeah, are, are you finishing up this year? It's just how it, how it changes with the age profiles now, yeah. Yeah, Pat, um, I believe that Dave McIntyre, um, he, he hung you out to dry a little bit when you were doing the, the, the analysis of the Tipperary Cork game and mentioned how you'd been sent off when you were marking Jason Ford. When that Boris won't be Lee the first time now either. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so Burris Lee Silvermines game recently. The thing that really stood out to me, because I was down there watching it, was how, you know, I'm sure you didn't mean to clip his helmet to get that second yellow card, but you were just aghast that it was a free. And uh, I, I went looking, I went, I contacted a lad, Burris Lee, looking for a video of you getting sent off a few years ago for shoulder and Seamus Callan in the chest. He wouldn't send it on, and I'll just show you the image that he sent me instead. And the thing that I actually loved was back then as well, you got a red card, and straight away you were saying it wasn't even a free in the first place. So we'll have that image coming up shortly, but you've got to be happy with Martin Ryan de Glaive, who decided not to team you up with that extra bit of info. There's the image there. He, said, he sent that picture of himself in the tractor saying, Wi-Fi not great here. So that's why he couldn't <laughs> send it on. So you must be happy with him for not sending that on, Pat. Fair play to him. He knows he got back in spades, but um, Asher, look, that's... Play on the edge, that's, that's, that's what everyone should be doing as far as I'm concerned. Well, the question I was going to ask you is, of those tip, that tip inside forward line, because it looks like it's absolute dynamite on its best day, who's the toughest to mark, Jason Ford, Seamus Callanan or John McGrath? Jesus, that's uh, pick or poison. Oh, uh, genuine, I, I usually have an opinion on everything, but... Um, you don't say. That is, that, <laughs> that is just, that, that's very... That's 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 very hard. To, they're so hard to mark. Um, certainly, I've only marked Jason. Uh, that's the first time I've marked him in a few years, and a really big difference physically since I was marking him a few years ago. Like he's he's really a lot quicker off the mark and just quicker on the feet. And he he did need that. Like so, he's he's a lot harder. He's very strong. If there's a ball out in front of him, he's very very strong. He's hard to get in around. So he's he's tough going. Now he might burn you. You see, that's the only thing. He might not burn you. But um, shame then if he gets a ball like it's you're, you're under pressure for pace. If he has space and he gets around you, and like the three, the thing about the three of them is they have they have a fantastic touch and good reading. So if they do get good ball, like you're just trying to pound fires really. You're just trying to hope that you can cut their angles off right and left. That you use your feet, keep them out towards the sideline. And if they do take a shot, that it's over the shoulder. But you're hoping that they pass it off really. That you cut off the angle. That you have enough speed done that you, you're within arm length, hurley length, to, to get that they don't want to take the shot on. And I marked John McGrath last year twice. And he's just like a mind, I don't want to say the word, but he, he, he messed with your mind because he's such a good mover. He doesn't say, it's not that he doesn't stay still, but when the ball is around his region, and especially if Noel has it, he knows it's going to go to the position that's advantageous. So he's moving in behind it. A lot of ours just move out to the side, out to the space, but he'll move you, he'll try and move you backwards and left and right so that he knows uh, he has a space to run into when the ball comes in. So you have to actually, you just have to take a lot of chances against them because if you stay behind them all day, they're just going to roast you. Like, so it's kind of calculated risks. So I, I couldn't tell you who I'd like to mark the most, but I uh, prefer not to mark any of them if I had a choice. Yeah, and we're just going to look at a couple of images of Seamus Callanan and the ball that he didn't get against Cork last week because he got himself isolated one-on-one -on -one inside a few times and I think that he should have been fed. Um, the image will be coming up now shortly. But if you look at this scenario here, and I've obviously gone colour and book on it again here, but there's Seamus Callanan isolated on the 14-yard line and there's a couple of situations and the two, the two of these um, images are mirror images more or less whereby someone has taken a shot from 60 or 70 yards out and Callanan is free on the 14, 1v1. You pop that in front of him. That's, that's got to be an area for, for improvement this week, Mick. 
Oh, definitely, yeah. Without a doubt, he didn't. He didn't get that sort of ball that he, that he really craves, and that's why I think there's so much room for improvement there this week. And they're going to be playing against the Waterford team that's not going to have either of their first choice sweepers in front of them. Like so, chances are there's going to be more opportunities for that sort of kind of ball in around the edge of the square, or maybe the sweeper might be caught out in positions. Waterford, like it's a, it's a. A sorry situation that they're after winding up in. The two, like the two first try sweepers that they would have, are both going to be off the field. So I'd say there will be a lot more opportunities for that. Funny, like Shamey just worked himself. He, he worked to perform well last week. It could. Paddy knows only too well. Like after five minutes, he could have a ball in his hand in the edge of the square, and he could have a goal rattle. It's just different games are, are you know games are completely different. So I'm expecting them to kind of work that kind of play a bit more and work that tactic a bit more he's too dangerous not to be feeding mm. we'll come back and ask the two who, who how you think Watford can win this game because with all those injuries we'd expect Tipperary to come through here um, so here's Dan Shanahan on the injury situation in Watford just now yeah I'm looking yeah, Dan Shanahan I'm looking Ty Gara Barry and Kevin are definitely out for next week and you've Christian Max over Noel and Morris Shanahan Austin Gleeson and Potty Man you like you know so mm. that's eight players of last year's I learned yeah on the panel, like you know, and but look, we have other lads that can step up to the mark. So we answer it. We're not. It's not an excuse. I ain't like that. We'll we go on train tonight. Um, assess the injuries. Assess who we'll have for um the weekend and and drive it on for there. Yeah. So do you give Waterford any chance, or how can they turn this around? I tell you what was was funny. Like despite like two of their best players not starting, and four of their best players ending up on the on the line, and Brick been taken off just because I think he wasn't in the game. They actually still perform quite well, mm. and they finished with 14 as well, um, which was surprising because they easily could have put their heads down and just looked at, okay, we'll build for next week. Tommy Ryan came on and played well. Stephen Bennett played well when he came on. They're probably just a bit light at the back, realistically. Like they they do have a, a strong, would say, one to nine. But Ty De Bork is going to be gone. Probably hard to see. Probably Noel Connors playing after pulling a muscle in his back as well. Dara Five's gone as well. Um, I think I think they'll. Do well enough. Tipperary have been their bogey team really down through the last couple of years. Um, as you say, I don't think they've beaten them in the last ten years. Yeah, you know? lost the last seven games and the last the last four by an average of fourteen points. Um, Pad, do you give Watford any chance here? Um, I do give them a chance if Tipperary turned up like they did against Limerick and the first half against Cork. I certainly give them a chance. Uh, the only thing I'd say is the the, the four he said there's a doubt over. You can be certain they'll be starting now, you know. So they will take mind, and that you know, and you'd have to look at tape. And are they going to be softened up, thinking that okay, we won't have to expend much energy this weekend? You know, just subconsciously. Obviously, it won't be said like, but subconscious, subconsciously, will there be a thought of right, we'll we'll win this, and and look, we'll try and keep enough energy for next week against Clare, which they absolutely can't do. And and the last point I'd make is. Uh, last year in the league was it quarter or semi quarter final? Watford changed a lot of their team. And they played Galway in Galway and should have beaten them. And we're well ahead of them. Uh, there could have been 10 points up at one stage. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So they, I thought that was their best performance in the league. Now, league and championship, I know, way, way different. And experience is needed. But maybe a little freshening up there and a bit of naivety, which I think Tipperary kind of actually need at the minute, could be, could be very beneficial for them. So look, Tipperary should be winning it if they have all those injuries. Um, but if they turn up the way they did... It's going to be a hard, hard, and especially if you turn up against that blanket defence and you're quite lazy, things are, you know, a little bit slow, then you're in trouble because you're giving the other team so much time to defend it. So uh, certainly give them a chance, but Tip should be winning it if they have any hopes. Of, mm. but, um, As the saying goes, the only team that can beat Tip is Tip. Yeah. Right, Mick, uh, Cork versus Limerick. Are Cork going to be deflated after that second half? Or are they going to be like, well, you know what, we showed our potential. Um, are Limerick going to be buoyant after their win over Tipperary and they've had the extra week, whereas Cork are... You know, they've obviously been playing in the meantime. Yeah, Cork had a chance to put the, the nail in the tip coffin, which and like at half time there's no point in saying any difference. You couldn't you couldn't see really tip coming back like that. And it was funny, um I think the wet ball really affected Cork actually. And it's it's a bit maybe it's a bit mad to say that like weather could affect one team more they than another. They weren't able to work the ball out no, as easily. They as weren't, they no. And yeah. it wasn't nearly nearly as slick like all the they they, they were so slick in the first half. Like it didn't look like Tipperary were going to be able to get near them even in the second half. But the wet ball, just it just means, I think it's great for a back anyway. Because mm. it just gives you, there's a, chan there's a chance his touch is going to be a bit heavier. You know, the, 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 the cork forwards who are so slick get the ball in their hand really, really quickly. It just didn't stick, didn't stick as easy. And there was just a small bit of panic 
about them. When Tip get, got, started getting back into the game, there was just that bit of panic. I don't think. I think that's a really interesting game. Again, it's a really, it's a really interesting weekend. Uh, Limerick uh, will definitely still be like on a high after the the win against Tip, and Cork are probably. Apart from Galway or Cork, the, the farm team in the championship, kind of given they've played two games, Limerick were the farm team over one game. So it's a very yeah, that's uh, that's going to be that's going to be a pretty tough game to call now. In fairness, I, I I'd see very very little there. I wouldn't be a bit surprised if there was another draw as well because I'm expecting a few more of them. And our viewers out there, don't forget that you can comment on Facebook, uh, Twitter, and YouTube, and we'll, we'll get the questions thrown out here. Um, Paddy, how do you see this game going? Well, the watch for tip one. No, the Cork Limerick. Sorry, Cork Limerick. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I was I was thinking about that today, and and who be who be playing. Um, I see that Cork. I think I think it'd be very very close, but Cork myself, I think should be better. They actually play a similar type of game in that it's it's so well coached. Like that's the one thing I noticed about Cork last week. No matter. Okay, the wet ball then affected the second half. I thought as well, actually, Vernie. But the no matter what shape Tip were taking in the first half in defence. They still had a little uh, formula for getting around it. So if if they were let go very short, I saw their full forward line packing in towards the Tipperary goals, and it left their half forward line with so much yardage to run around. So I thought that was very interesting. So it seemed like they had a way to play. Limerick the very same against Tipperary. They had certain ways the ball was supposed to go in, and certain way they were defending uh, as a unit. So their coach very similar. I think though that Cork just have better forwards at the minute. I think their forward line is, a, yeah, I think it's a little bit better. Uh, I think Tip should have been better on Limerick's back line or on Limerick's forward line. It should have been tighter. The ball going in wasn't great. But I think if, Cor- if, if they're both playing a game where they can hurl, I think Cork will do it because Cork are so dangerous and they opened up Tip so many times. Like Limerick were playing against the Tip team and they dominate him and they still weren't able to destroy him. Mm. And we, we, know about, uh, we know about plenty of those class players in the Limerick team, the likes of Aaron Galan up front, Peter Casey should be back from injury soon, Mike Casey, his brother, is, is going to start. Um, that half-back line was sensational with Dermot Burns, Dan Morrissey and uh, Declan Hannan. But you coached um, Tom Morrissey, who's playing wing forward, probably an unsung hero. What's Tom mm. Morrissey like? What's he bring to the table? Great, great um, attitude, like, which is the number one thing of any sports player, I suppose. Absolutely fantastic attitude. Doesn't have to say a lot. Hard work. And even back then, I think he was 50 at the time. And I remember this is in Castle Troy. In Castle Troy College, yeah. In the, in the what's it called, the Hearty Cup, yeah. So he was he was excellent. He was strong as a horse even back then. Great strong runner. Um, but a good head. He was a team player though. That was it. And you look, look at him with Galway or with Limerick there now. He doesn't get ruffled. He takes his shots on. He'll only take the right shots on. Um, he's a real team player so uh, as well as that he's such a good worker like, and that's, that's what goes along with having a great attitude he's not going to be the silkiest like he's, he's obviously has, has his basics perfect but he's not the silkiest player but I mean you couldn't have six all silky players anyway so uh, I think he's going to be a great player for them over the next seven, eight years uh, he's like a battering ram in clearance team and he's just see the size of him now since maybe two years ago he's, he, he's a battering ram yeah, so that's that, that inside line of, of Cork at the other end of the field. Shane Kingston went to town against Tipperary, and I don't know how he wasn't mangled when he went in for that goal yeah. chance. He was able to, in a lot of traffic. And then you've also got Patrick Horgan and Seamus Harnady was doing a lot of damage too, not to mention Conor Lahan as well. So for, for Limerick, how do they stop that inside line? And what do you make of Mike Casey starting? I, I think Seamus Hickey has an injury, but he had a lot of rash fouls against... He, he gave away four frees in the first half against Tipperary, so... In some ways, is Mike Casey an upgrade, or is that an unfair comment? Yeah, Seamus is probably over enthusiastic almost against Tipperary, just like mad, mad to get on the ball, and just probably was like maybe two up on top of his man almost. Yeah, my, I, Mike Casey's a Mike, Mike Casey's a very good man marker, and I think he would nearly suit that. He's probably even more mobile than Seamus as well, and maybe. A, uh, taken the right way, a small bit tidier as as a defender. He's very very tidy when he's around the ball. He re- he will rarely when it's around his feet or like that. It will invariably come into his hand and it will be worked out. So I don't think that's a bad move coming in there. He's very very mobile as well. And you have to be so flexible. Like an old style fullback wouldn't work against wouldn't work against Cork. You have to be so mobile and flexible and be able to play cornerback, wingback, and be able to move around. So I don't think that's a that's a bad thing there. They will try and cut off the ball coming into the full forward line basically and the half back line are going to have to be as dominant as the world last day I don't see them being as dominant I, I think it was a small bit false against Tip um, I, I actually think there's a small bit of naivety on 
the half back line and I think they were shown up to be maybe a bit better than they are. I think they'll be taken down to earth a small bit. But they that's where they will need to that line will need to be seriously strong and stop the ball coming in. But they're not going to be standing on the sixty five or between the sixty five and forty five like they were the last day. They're going to be pulled and dragged everywhere because um Cork are just going to try and create as much space as they can. So I I think uh, I think what Paddy said, I think the, the Cork forward line just has a bit more kind of oomph about it. And are proud like some of the scores Limerick got against Tip were soft enough. Like you wouldn't, you wouldn't, I wouldn't be expecting Graham Mulcahy to have four points against the Tip back line. Mm-hmm. Realistically, would I expect Seamus Harry to have four or five? He could do that against anybody. Do you know what I mean? So I think, yeah, I think Cork just had that bit more kind of power up front. Paddy, what, what do you make of Mike Casey in this Limerick defence? Um, well, I didn't see him much now until um, the Cooler match this year. The two Cooler matches, and he was the only lad I seen at club hurling. Uh, with with the with what Kula played, assistant they played that they bring um, Conor Callan into the only man I seen to stop it or come anywhere close, and he did. He snuffed him right out and nearly won, and it nearly kind of knock on effect won the game for the Pearshik. So I think it's a plus that he's in there, uh, especially as Bernie was saying against Cork. He's smaller, he can move the feet, um, so I think he's a, he's a very good option. He's very tough. Like I mean, there's a lot of defenders, and they see the ball, they're like they're like a, you know a dog after a bone. They just want the ball, okay? And I think you know um, over the years, Seamus Hickey is definitely like that. He's used to being the fastest man in the field, really, and now maybe he's getting a little tense. The pace is coming down a little bit, and a good few injuries. So maybe Mike Casey is the right man, especially for Cork, but. He could find it harder now if he was coming up against maybe a bigger man, maybe maybe somebody from Galway or Shems Callan or somebody like that. He might find it harder. Up. This should be right down his alley. But again, if Corker let play the ball out from their half back line, full back line, there won't be a lot my case he can do if you know uh, Horgan is making little darting runs out ten or fifteen meters. Uh, the ball will be put in his mouth and it'll be over the bar. So um, uh, he's an addition, but it definitely have to depend on the rest of the team. Mm. So the two E are going for Cork by the sounds, but I'm actually going to go for Limerick. Um, I like some. I like a, the balance they have between power and a bit of class up front. I don't think they've got the. The absolute marquee, let's say, sort of TJ Reid, Seamus Callan, and Joe Canning type forward up there, even Conor Whelan. But uh, I do like the cut of Limerick's jib. I think they'll put Road Hegarty over on Mark Coleman and target him on high balls, even though we all know how brilliant Coleman is. I hope there's a straight up matchup between Keane Lynch and Dara Fitzgibbon. I think that'll be brilliant as well. So, but you're sticking with Cork? Um, I think it'd be very tight, but I'd say Cork by, by one or two. Okay. Well, let's, uh, let's um, have a quick look at the Joe McDonough Cup as well, because like it's it's been a fantastic tournament it's so far. Yeah, it's so tight. Like and as I said to you the last week, like everybody can beat everybody in, and that's kind of what's so kind of fascinating about it as well. And it's just uh, it's not getting the it's not getting the kind of recognition that that it deserves realistically. Some the games are I've listened to a couple of games on the radio now, particularly the Midlands games at Westmead and Leash, and they're like. Barn burners like great games. Yeah, there's there's a great round of games on this weekend. You've got Mead against Kerry, uh, you've got Leash against Carlo, and West Mead against Antrim, which is a bit of a table topper. And I saw a stat that there's been an average win winning average of just four points between the top five teams when they faced each other. Um, Carlo like Carlo away to Leash this weekend. Um, I went and I saw them play in the championship last year in the qualifiers. Great game. I'm not saying it was you know the level of. Galway versus Kilkenny, for example, but a really excellent game, exciting. Um, Carlo don't have Mouse um, Mouse Cavanagh yeah, this year, yeah. but the likes of Dennis Murphy, Chris Nolan, a good underage player as well, or just young player. So are Carlo rising in hurling? <laughs> Carlo rising, yeah. yeah, we're used to hearing it. Yeah, um, it's funny because Leash got an absolute lifeline by beating Antrim up in Antrim, like their year was over, and Eamon Kelly kind of couldn't really explain the first two defeats, they were just a bit below par. Westmead beat them for the first time in a good while. So that's a, that's a big game. Leash will need other results to go their way and to win this weekend and win the, the last weekend to kind of have a chance to be there in the wind-up. But I, I, would, I would see Leash probably a point or two ahead. I was actually chatting Matt Whelan at the, at the Offaly and Wexford game and he just he couldn't really put, put, down, put a reason for their first two displays. But as I said, they turn things around. Mousey Kavanagh or Marty Kavanagh is a massive loss. Like he's a... 
he's a kind of a one, two or one, three from play or four or five points in, in every game. And I'd say his loss would, would probably be just to kind of tip the balance for Leash. Leash are at home in that game as well, I think. So, yeah, and, they, yeah, and yeah. They, they, they really need to win. And they think they should be in the Joe McDonough final. They would have aimed for that at the start of the year. So I would just favour Leash there by a point mm. or two. We meant to get the table up there, but uh, just having a little difficulty with that at the moment. But Westmead are top at six points. Antrim next on four, as are Carlo, Kerry on two, Leash on two and Meath on two. Just to talk about Antrim, because you mentioned there the Leash getting the win. Um, Neil McMahon has got uh, a little shot in the mummy daddy button yeah. a few weeks ago against Carlo, but he played through that all the same, even though he had to get a little bit of a stitch up done. Um, Paddy, Liam, Liam Sheedy is doing some work up there at Antrim in with Sambo McNaughton. Can you talk to us about the effect that she, uh, Liam Sheedy would have up there? Yeah, well, I think first and foremost, it would be very exciting, I suppose, for the Antrim lads to get up. Um, a guy with such a reputation. Um, certainly, like, when he came into Tipperary, we were we were sunk. We were down to bottom, uh, as far down as we've been in a lot of years. And he pulled it right. And and like I, I've talked to people that say, you know, it was Eamon O'Shea was the brains behind it. And certainly there was a lot of Eamon O'Shea, a lot of Keane O'Neill. But without Liam Sheedy at the fore of it, then I don't think he would have had that figurehead or that drive. I mean, he just did not care. He just believed in himself. So, therefore, he's coaching guys. What are they going to do? They're going to believe in themselves. And he put the structure in place. So I imagine he's trying to drive that bit of belief into the Antrim lads. And when he takes a training session, like he didn't take too many with tip. But when he did, it was very, very ball related. But it was it was unbelievably intense. Like it was it was hard as you could do it for as long as you could do it. Forget about even missing the ball. Just go for the ball as hard as you can. And it was to do it very, very quick. And if you were to look at some of the lower tier in the hurling, you would say that people aren't doing things as quick as they can do them or they're not doing it as intensely or as sharply. So uh, I think he would push that into it. And it probably gives the, the, the fellas up there a real lift and sort of raises their level of what an inter-county player should be and bring in maybe the professionalism from uh, maybe his time at Tipperary or his time at a couple of clubs up to that. So it would be, you know, it would be a real drive on for them because they're very far away from everybody else up there. It, you know, it's too, probably... To Dublin is, is the close they can get a very good challenge match. So uh, they could do with that bit of impetus going forward and look, it looks to be doing pretty well from so far. What I like about that is it's, it's not like a tokenistic thing you know, where he's going up once a week or whatever or he's going in and taking a session. He seems to, like, just from... He was doing an interview there in the, the Sunday game launch. It just seems like he's massively like bought into it and they have bought into him like and he's up there regularly and he's in a really important part of the setup. It's not just a, you know coming in every now and then or anything like that and like Sambo is so passionate like that's great yeah, yeah like he is like and like I was up in the Giants Causeway not too long ago and it, it is it's so far everything is so far away from you know getting challenge games and things like that but you, you can like when you're around any matches or anything like that out there you can just sense the passion that they have it. and it's relatively small pockets but they love the hurling and even Neil that was on a couple of weeks ago like like he's as, he is as good a player as is in any other county. The tallies he's putting up in the the Joe McDonough are they're outrageous. Like particularly um, carrying carrying the injuries that he had been carrying. Yeah. Like I heard I was chatting to somebody that was at that game and they just said for fifty minutes it was just run of the mill kind of a game and then it just looked like there was axe murderers going around on the yeah. field and there was all sorts of shenanigans going on. But um, that's just like some of, they are some of the best games. They don't because. It's almost like there's that same pressure almost, but there just there seems to be a bit more kind of freedom at that level as well. And you can just get some of the, yeah, you can get some rip roaring games. And uh, I would just kind of encourage people to, to be kind of getting to games if you can, particularly on Saturdays, like, and they're on Saturday afternoons a lot of the time. Yeah, you wouldn't be disappointed anyway. Yeah, so there's a great round of games this weekend, mm -hmm. so keep an eye on that. Now, the next thing I want to do is we had a Twitter poll this week um, on Off the Ball to see who's the best goalkeeper in the country at the moment in, in Hurling. And Tom, I, have my, I have my answer anyway, regardless, well, hold on what, a Twitter, second regardless now. what Twitter says. We'll get Tommy Walsh's uh, view on it first. Listen to this. Yeah, it's, uh, Nash sure is just, has everything. Owen Murphy has everything. Um, get off the fence, know, Tommy. Listen, yeah, it's uh, Nash sure is just has everything. Owen Murphy has everything. Um, Get off the know, fence, Tommy. Listen, yeah, I won't. No, I won't sit in the fence on this. I'd say Murphy. Whoa, he's sticking with his own. Yeah, well, I've seen him. I've seen him, and I've marked him even out the field there this year in the club, and he just has it all. And 
there's not much, you know, there's not much between the two of them now. I, I won't lie to you, but this guy is a small lad. He's probably smaller than Nash, but he's able to jump up and catch puck outs over the crossbar. He did it against Waterford there a few years ago, and uh, you know, it's Murphy. But with, with I'll say that with kind of uh, experience. What characteristics do you look for in a goalkeeper behind you? What What are the characteristics that define their greatness? Uh, the first thing would be safety. That when that ball, high ball goes in, that, you know, nine times, well, 9.9 times out of 10, they're going to catch the ball or, or make it safe. After that, I think uh, to be able to stop the ball one on one is, is, is crucial. Um, like Brendan Cummins uh, was unbelievable at. Uh, one of the, I'd say the best goalie i ever seen really was Damien Fitzhenry from Wexford. I played, um, we play a cancer match every year, uh, Jim, Jim Bulger, uh, mm. the, the Wexford man there, he's the horses in Kilkenny up in Muckley. He runs um, Self and Davy Russell, a, a charity match for cancer every year. And I've played with Fitzhenry and I played Railway Cup with him as well. That man is just incredible and he's getting better with age. <laughs> so, uh, and he was brilliant at the one-on-ones and diving to the, to the top corners and that. So, yeah, I'd say safety first, then one-on-ones. That's and one little worry. Puck out. Nash, Nash, is, Nash is the best puck out in the game. I will, get, I will definitely say that about him. Well, that's Tommy's view anyway. We'll get the Twitter poll up on screen just here. So you can see there, Anthony Nash is after winning at 46%. Owen Murphy at 37%. Stephen O'Keefe of Waterford with 11%. And Colm Callanan, who's currently injured, and James Gell is deputising for him, uh, is in at 6%. Um, we could only fit four into the poll, so the likes of Mark Fanning as well. I mean, he probably feels a little bit hard, hard done by, and rightly so. Uh, what's your take there, Mick? Uh, I go on Murphy as well. Yeah, um, I just th- I think he has it all. He's like a jack in the box in the goals as well. The energy he has it around the place, and he's the only goalkeeper I have seen. You cannot say that Anthony Nash is um, his left side is strong. If you bring him on to the other side, he's not going to be as effective. Owen Murphy is more effective, if not off his left hand. He is technically perfect off his left hand side which is actually phenomenal he can strike he's brilliant off his right but have you seen him on his left like he can he stands up striking on his left and he can strike at 100 yards it's it's actually i think it's phenomenal usually you, you would put a keeper most right hand side keepers you bring him to the left and you get a shorter clearance or a hanging clearance his is just drilled that's not to bring in his long range free taking his shot stop and last sunday was brilliant again I just I think he has it all. The only shame is he's that good in goals. Like I would love to see him at midfield. Well, he got forward. a run outfield at, some, at one stage when he first went in, and obviously it didn't quite work out. Or maybe the different. It'd be a different story now, though. He, he, he was mature now. Like I, yeah. I I think they'd love to have him in the forward line. He but scored eleven points from eight games this year as well, yeah. so he's valuable from that point of view. Oh look, Kenny have conceded sixteen goals in all competitions this Imagine year. Imagine how many more they would have yeah. conceded if he well, wasn't there. It might actually be before before last mm. week's game against Galway. He's their best goalie in the last twenty five years. I think he's opinion. the best goalie of all time, by the way. Paddy, where do you stand on this poll? Uh, yeah, I definitely think Murphy is the best myself. Um, he's um, he's he, he's the obvious outfielder playing in the goals you know he's a sweeper there if anybody gets in around he can come out he can flick the ball away especially as well then when he has the ball there's no lad going to catch him like there's there's no lad going to be able to shove him I see a lot of goalies to get the ball and you're like the worst time that you know the worst part of them being a goalie is when they have the ball and you're waiting for him to drop it or get pushed aside. It's like it's like a member of the public walking down the street tackling an intercounty hurdle. <laughs> no, a lot of the time, uh, because they haven't. They, they were in the goals for a reason, most of them, and that's because they weren't they weren't that good out to feed. They were useless. Who knows? But a lot of them might might have been they mightn't have been fast. They mightn't have been strong, but had fantastic skill. And they're coming out the field with the ball, and you're waiting for him to get pushed out of the way, and no foul. Uh, so I think oh, it's fantastic to have him there and he said jumps up, catches balls. But even the other day, there was six, was there six, five goal chances Kilkenny conceded before the break, and he had a hand in a few stopping him. Like I think he's amazing uh, shot stopper. I think he, if you told him he had to have puck outs, uh, the range that Nash had, I think he'd be able to do it. Mm. I think if they put their tactics around. Uh, okay, we're going to isolate defenders here, there, and everywhere. He'd hit it long, he'd hit it short, he'd hit it wherever you want, and it looks effortless. Like he does play sharp puck outs now, and geez, at times, if I'm in a full back line, a goalie's hitting a sharp puck out, it's, like, it's nearly the hardest one sometimes because it looks so easy. But he's just striking it. I've seen him doing just left and right from a dead ball situation. Uh, and I'd say the fact he's good in his left is because he was an outfielder, whereas a lot of goalies, they're years and years, muscle memory, hitting it off their strong side. So Nash is unreal. He, 
that, especially in that system, two unbelievable saves the other day. But uh, if I had to, I'd probably pick Murphy. Mm. So it's fairly unanimous. But we got a few texts in and not everybody agrees. So one of them is only one winner and it's Sock, which is Stephen O'Keefe. The reigning defending all-star keeper, ain't that right? Dave Tyrrell says... Reigning defending. <laughs> 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 Sounds like a wrestling yeah, event you yeah. go to. You missed an awfully game over <laughs> Uh, Dave Tyrrell uh, sends in, uh, lads, did you miss Mark Fanning? And uh, yeah, we did. Uh, well, we couldn't fit him into the poll. And James Lahart says Murphy by a country mile. We're actually so. spoiling at the moment because even like, unfortunately, like Offaly's best player is our goalkeeper at the moment. Who also has played outfield for his club. Yeah, you know, yeah. yeah, and yeah. like, it, we're probably spoiled. Yeah, like we were with Damien Fitzhenry during the week, I think, and it, he was kind of saying like it probably is like it coming into like a golden age of goalkeepers again. Which brings us to my next point on Wexford Galway, who are clashing this weekend. Anything less than a Leinster are definitely getting to the All Ireland semi or All Ireland final is no progress on last year. Damien Fitzhenry said of Wexford. Yeah, it's um, bold, bold enough thing to say. I suppose um, they, they think they have enough kind of enough talent to be pushing on again. So it's it's a fair point. I'm sure Davy will be thinking that as well. He mightn't be outwardly saying it, but like a provincial title. Imagine what a Leinster would mean for them. And if they were able, to, they would bring them straight through to a semi-final as well. Or if they were able, to, I think he kind of said if they got to a semi-final, that that would be progress as well. But um, yeah, but that's I'm sure that's inwardly what Wexford are saying in the dressing room that that's probably what their aims are. But it's not going to be it's not going to be easy either. Mm, Galway absolutely brushed Kilkenny aside, and we're going to look at a couple of pictures from last year's Leinster final to show how important Sean Murphy is going to be in this game because I think. I think it's like if you've got a spare man at the back, he's got to be getting on the ball several times per game and helping you work the ball up the field. And obviously that, that is Wexford's plan and they've a bit of a, a total hurling sort of style where they work it up the field, a bit of running game. They try and target Conor McDonald inside. But if we can get up an image last year of Sean Murphy and his, his attempt to sweep in the... Um, you, you can see him here. So this is, this is during the... It might be this first half. So you can see Sean Murphy is there in red. And he's defending from behind, as is his goalkeeper. So if that ball doesn't break behind, Sean Murphy is a little bit irrelevant here. Yeah. Like he's just there to stop a goal happening. Conor Cooney is the is the guy in the centre of the D. He ends up winning the ball and popping a point. And we can see it from a second view as well from behind the goals. That again, Sean Murphy, he's he's really only there as a last gasp. And I think it's a little bit conservative. Because like fair enough, there's a couple of runners coming through there. If we can flick onto the second image there. But there's a couple of runners coming through, and yeah, he will stop a goal in that scenario. But at times, it's tough for a sweeper, and uh, we had a league match there at the club during the week, and I was playing that position, and it is tough. But you need to be getting out in front as well, and, and trusting the guy behind you. And like, it's a tough scenario, but Sean Murphy needs to be relevant this, in this game, Paddy. Yeah, that, Paddy, that's, that's, that's for you. Sean Murphy needs to be relevant in this game. He needs to be getting on the ball a lot. Like The Jeez. league quarter-final against Kilkenny, he touched the ball yeah, nine times what, in the what game. I we're talking to Verney there. Um, <laughs> no, I know what you're saying, but um, the other thing is, I was thinking about it there, ideally you want him on ball, but look what I said about Kilkenny there last week. Um, they had six goal chances before half, uh, Galway before half-time against Kilkenny. Okay, like... I I don't agree with having a sweeper. You don't want to, nobody wants to play one. You want to have six backs that are brilliant and well able. But sometimes when you're playing the likes of those, uh, you might have to if you want to stay in the game. What I'd be saying about that is he might look like he's doing a whole pile, but you know it's like it's like having a security man at the Plowing Championships. If he's not there, there's going to be a lot of things robbed. And if <laughs> hey, there, Paddy, there'll be things robbed anyway, regardless of whether it's a security <laughs> man. Exactly, and goals will go in, but. How many goals will go in if there's no security man there? Okay, so it's telling Galway, right? You can't get it. You can't get a, a free run at goals here. Like if Cooney picks up them balls or whoever's running through, they take him on and go for the goal if there's not an extra man back there. So look, they prefer not. They think they really think they want to have a man that far back. They don't. But ideally, they want him out in front. If I was them, I would play him a little bit out in front, and I tell my backs, look, if that ball's coming in. By hook or by crook, get out to Cooney, get out to Joe Canning, get out to Whelan and spoil the bloody thing. Hold on to him, spoil it, and he should be there waiting for it. Or if the boy's doing it in the backs, he should be there uh, getting hand pass. But it's interesting to note, though, um, how his effectiveness has, has tapered off a little bit, I think, in, uh, since maybe the championship last year. In the last couple of games, didn't seem to be getting on as much uh, ball. I think teams are getting used to playing against the sweeper. It doesn't make it very easy, and it still doesn't mean you'll score a lot but they're getting used to not getting that person on the ball or maybe even shutting that 
sweeper down, Sean Murphy, excellent ball player, shutting him down and maybe him having to pass it off to um, a less able uh, cornerback, wingback or whoever it is. So people are getting used to it. It still is difficult to play against, but um, he, he needs to be getting more, more, more ball maybe. Yeah, well, let's have a little quick look at how Joe Canning played last week against um, against Kilkenny. He scored four points from play, and he was just roaming all over the place. You can see him here in, in the centre. And how destabilising is that for the Kilkenny defence to have to like that's just early on in the game, and they're already there's oceans of space around him. He was out wing forward. He scored a couple of points off Paul Murphy. He was in centre forward. He got a few points. And if we if we flick onto a couple of other pictures, this is him later on in the game. Look at the amount of Galway players back. Canning is able to pick up the ball, and he's able to hit that ball into space and on they go again and if we cycle on to one more picture this is Canning getting the ball later on you like the old old school 90s Sky Sports running effect I've put in the in the picture there he actually carries the ball forward into space and throws it over the lat I think um, last year Matthew O'Hanlon man marked um, Joe Canning for the entire game scored two points off Joe who didn't score from play do you think that, uh, that that's a better scenario for Wexford that you man mark rather than allowing him to cycle into different areas when you allow him to go into different areas, you're relying on lads to be in those zones. I think it's an awful lot less reliable than if you detail a player. Now, fair enough, if you detail a player, that means that if Joe is standing out on the sideline, that his man is going to be there with him and there's going to be more space. But keeping him out of the game is an awful lot more worthwhile. The only problem is is that Joe Cooney got 1-4 against Offaly, scored nothing at the weekend. Conor Cooney got a couple of scores against Offaly, got four at the weekend. They are in the great situation now where they have other lads that can pick up the fall. And it's like Kilkenny back in the day. Henry only gets a point from play, Eddie Brennan gets 1-3. Kilkenny are in that situation now. I would still detail a man marker on Joe. I think he's too dangerous. He scored four points the other day. Um, and you just can't afford to have him influencing the game like that. Mm. I, I see Galway winning this game, and like if we can zoom in on the tactics board here, one of the things that I think is going to be crucial for, for uh, Galway is trying to snuff out Conor McDonald. So if he's playing, now first of all we've got Joe Cannon getting man-marked here, so that's, that's the way that they're going to set up. I think Conor McDonald is going to be in here on Dahi Burke, and I'd worry about how he's going to get isolated, because you have all these Wexford players milling around here, you have Rory O'Connor, Lee Chin, uh, Jack O'Connor on the puck outs, uh, this type of affair, and Jack O'Connor and Lee Chin had a lot of joy on the puck outs a couple of weeks ago in the league. But I just worry, we, we've got an image here from last year's Leinster final of how isolated Conor McDonald is at times. Because if you look at here, and I've gone old school FIFA 95 with the stars under the defenders there, Conor McDonald is surrounded in red, and then you can see. Like, what hope does he have there? So how do Wexford make sure that there are more, there's more support for Conor McDonald so that he has a chance to get a goal or two here? Yeah, he has no hope in that situation. And it's, it is getting frustrating. And you could see the first day against Dublin that he was frustrated by the sweeper as well. Wexford are, going, Wexford, are like, Wexford are going to need probably a couple of goals to win the game, realistically. So they're going to have to play through the lines an awful lot better. They're not good. They cannot be, cannot have definitely not afford to be launching ball straight in on top of them. And like, the thing with Dahi Burke is as well, I don't know if anybody's going to get much joy out of him, really. So maybe McDonald doesn't necessarily have to be on the edge of the square if Dahi Burke is picking him up. I always think the best tactic with Dahi Burke is to try and pull him away from the square if at all possible. So if McDonald can take him even just over here and you have Hanbury or someone else in around the edge who he possibly will get a bit more joy from, McDonald might necessarily do all that much but if you're, t it's funny to say that you could be man marking a full back in a sense. But if you're taking him away from the goals, that's how you get a bit of joy. Yeah, it's all about identifying mismatches. Paddy, what way do you see this game going? Um, I see it being extremely close. Um, down in Wexford Park, they've had some brilliant results there in the last few years. And look, uh, Galway have two wins on the board. They're kind of sailing and can often be the time when you think you're you're riding the wave so high that it that it gets cut from under you. So. Um, I can't say I see Wexford definitely winning, but I think it'll be extremely close. Um, the, they they are aiming for they're aiming for the top now. The only thing is, if 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 Wexford are aiming for these heights this year, um, if they don't win kind of Sunday, it's going to start taking the sail, you know, the wind out of their sails, which it did last year in the Leinster final. They kind of weren't the same team afterwards. So um, I think they've added to it this year, though. They're certainly attacking better. Uh, Foley wing back has added a lot coming from deep midfield. Is it Foley midfield as well, actually? Yeah. Left hand is that. He's popping scores over there. So I think they've, and O'Connor, obviously, they've added, actually added a lot more attacking uh, definition. And as well, like Vernie now, Dahi uh, Burke full back is a monster. 
I'd be nearly detailing maybe I'd, I'd put a defender in on him and try and drag him away <laughs> because there's no one if the ball like Galway it's so hard to get good ball in against Galway because they're absolute animals around the field they were able to throw the Kilkenny lads it, was, it reminded me of Kilkenny back in the noughties up to the late noughties early 2000s uh, or sorry up to early 2010s is you can't run out without getting an air and pulling you back it's mm. just the most off putting or even throwing a hand pass to the next man who's free and your air and gets dragged and that's, that's how they're hurling at the minute. And it doesn't take them a whole pile through that, whereas for the, the Wexfords and the Kilkennys, they have to put all their might into everything. Whereas mm. the Galway lads, they will put all their might into everything, but you feel it twice as much. Um, so I think they're physically improved, Wexford. They've added players to it. I expect it to be quite close. They're at home. It will be fever pitch down there. But I could see Galway still sneaking by a couple of pints. But if, there was a, you know, if you had a plus three or four now with, with Wexford, I'd, I'd take it. Mick, we're going to move on to Offaly against Dublin as well. Massive relegation match, you'd imagine. Yeah. Unless, like, I mean, Dublin could win and still somehow make it in, make it through to the All Ireland series as well. But fourth weekend in a row for for Offaly, which is huge. I mean, last year, last week, got absolutely hammered by Wexford. There were three red cards. Oshin Kelly is the only person who is suspended now. Do you give Offaly much of a chance going up to Parnell Park? Well, you always give them a chance, and you try to be optimistic. But like, having been over in in Wexford or over in Tullamore last week. It was seriously deflating, and I, I, Kevin Martin has been unbelievably positive the whole way through. I just didn't like we were tired this week. Like, fair enough. Bit you, you, you're going to be tired next week. You're going to be more tired next week. Do you know what I mean? For the most important game that you have, and I think Ocean Kelly's a big loss. He um, he was one of the few that got didn't got a bit of joy off the Wexford defence, and we need like we're to me like we're going to need to hit three or four goals. And he was a likely candidate to hit one or two of them, and I just think, I, I, I unfortunately, I, I think our goose kind of looks cooked at the moment. If if last week is anything to go on, Parnell Park has never been a happy hunting hunting ground either. Dublin had a a week off. Unfortunately, I think every everything kind of points to, to a Dublin win. Mm. Paddy, just to get your prediction on this one. Yeah, I'd say um, I'd say Dublin. Um, they've been steadily, you know, they haven't had great results so far but they've played well and playing well for that team at the minute is worth a lot um, they mightn't go through in the group but if they're making progress they're happy I can imagine you know um, Gilroy is, is, is reaffirming that this is a project to them um, and as well they're all hungry for their position so up in Parallel Park we saw them against Kilkenny if they bring the level of aggression that they did against Kilkenny um, I think awfully on the bounce is it on the bounce for four Four weeks now. Yeah, I find it very, very hard to keep to keep that going. Um, this point, I haven't seen more of Offaly on the on the television to see what way they're actually playing because they've had a couple of good performances by all accounts as well. But Dublin, the first day, they seem to have their spinal team fairly good, which, as we all know, is so important. And um, maybe without Keeney, there's a bit of problems. But uh, you know, you can't see Dublin not winning it, especially after how um, deflating it was last week. OK, Paddy, we'll say goodbye to you there. Thanks very much for joining us today. All right, see you, lads. And say hello to Mammy for me. Right, Mick, uh, who's going to win that game? Just quick prediction. Uh, I think Dublin will win by a couple of scores. Yeah. OK, so during the week we had uh, Michal Omerhartig in the, in the office and he was talking to Jared Gilroy and he gave a great rundown of, the, of Offaly actually in the Leinster competition in the early 80s. And an awfully player got an eye injury that day. I didn't know he was going to hospital. I, when I went in there, didn't I meet three of the awfully players? And we were talking usually about the match. And after a while, one of them said to me, you're talking a lot about Kilkenny and Wexford. Did you see us at all? I said, I didn't see much of you because while you were playing, I was over in the dressing rooms finding out all about the match I was broadcasting. And Paddy Delaney did say, don't roll us out now for the final. Now you'd feel like laughing, but you couldn't. <laughs> and uh, Paddy was a great friend of mine, after, like all of them. But they did win, playing very good hurling. Mm. And the strange thing, the captain was Paddy Horton. Now it was afterwards I heard the real story. After the game, he was the captain, he had to be interviewed. That would be the right thing. And I'd arrange for somebody that would waylay him and bring him up. And here I was interviewing him, maybe 15 minutes after the game ending. 
and the goalkeeper Damien Martin appeared at the door and he was making all sorts of signals to me and he was pointing at Paulie and pointing at me and I hadn't a clue what he meant. I thought he wanted to be included. <laughs> but it wasn't that Walter had come to Proke Park that Paulie Horton's father died. Oh, God. They wouldn't let him come to the match. He had a bad heart. Oh, no. And I think he should have been there because he had played for Offaly at his time. His son was captain. And I went down naturally to the funeral and all that, but I learned he was watch, listening to the game in, in the kitchen and the grandchildren never there. It was getting very exciting towards the finish. Offaly was leading a little bit and there was pandemonium and he, with the children and he wasn't hearing it properly. And he said, I listen in the car. And he went out, sat into the car, to have the rest of it in peace. Once it was over, they all dashed out and he was dead in the car. Right. So I said, now look, he was the first into heaven saying that Offaly had won the Lancer Championship. <laughs> <laughs> right, we're joined by Jerry Gilroy and Leon Blanche of Boyle Sports just to preview the games and get a couple of odds here. Ger, you were like... You seem to be loving me, Holomer Hartig there. It reminded me of seeing that ball boy when uh, uh, Zlatan Ibrahimovic touched him on the head and he was just like, oh, you enjoyed that, didn't you? It was taking me with, uh, with Owen Sheehan. There was like a definite, Owen oh, kind of sat there all week and we had Kerry Legend after Kerry Legend coming in. So, um, so there is love-ins, wasn't there, during the week? There was, yeah, a lot of it going on, yeah. And we've got another one here as well. Leon, uh, just to touch on the first game, which is Offaly against Dublin, where do you... Yeah. Uh, hang on a second, sorry. You, yeah? You brought the, the younger, more talented, better-looking brother on. I just I think we should pay due deference to that. Well done, Shane. You're a big man. We all understand that now. And then it turned out that uh, when, when you were all camera on camera, it looked like you were wearing exactly the same clothes. It was almost like <laughs> you were dressing similar. each other. Yeah, yeah. I'd say they were three Christmas t-shirts. Uh, yeah. It was a two, two for one. Two for one, two for one yeah, offer, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. I bought him that and he bought me this. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, get into Offaly Dublin. <laughs> <laughs> look, Offaly Dublin. Um, Offaly, look, you lads have said it already, fourth week in a row. They look out on their feet last week. Um, I think the dubs will hammer them. Um, I think this is an uh, ideal opportunity for Dublin. Back at Parnell Park, where they nearly beat uh, Kilkenny. Um, I think Pat Gilroy has had two weeks. Um, they will have been a little bit disappointed that they took nothing from the first two games, even though they're playing well. It's well and good playing well, but you want to get something on the board. But I think this is an ideal opportunity, not just to get a victory, <clears throat> but I think they're well capable of covering the eight points. Yeah, I, um, think, I so. think Dublin minus eight at five to six. I'm sure it's going to be very, very popular. Offaly, they just, I mean, they looked out on their feet. This is the one thing that the GA will have to look at four weeks in a row is not fair. Yeah, it's needs, just not fair. Needs a break in the it does, absolutely. I think maybe if you play back to back and then get a week off and then come back again, go back to back, O'Shane Kelly, probably their only player I thought that could have made a difference against Dublin, a real difference. Um, so I think the Dubs comfortably should win this. Why were the three lads sent off? Was it three straight reds? or? Uh, one guy gave away two penalties within 90 seconds. Uh, the other one was a straight red, kind of shot right. to the face. And the, the third one, I think it was a case of mistaken identity because okay. the fellow that got sent off didn't do anything. So that's been that's been rescinded since mm. I think. Okay. But um, so they're not they're not without those three players. Just Dushin Kelly, yeah, yeah. yeah. But well, I think he's their biggest loss. Right, well, yeah. Dublin important. have only conceded one goal in their two games, so I, I do think after we need to score to above four to win. I think we yeah. need to we need to get above four twelve, four thirteen. And I can't see I can't see the goals coming. No, yeah, unfortunately, it'll be hard to cover the handicap. I think Dublin are going well. Um, I think Gilroy is, I just heard the back end of your chat, it is a project. But I think these are the type of games, all well and good being a project, you need to get out here, you need to win, and you need to win convincingly. And I think they will. Galway away to Wexford, there's a four point handicap there. I actually think uh, Galway will cover that. Do you? Yeah. Because they're such a machine, the way they threw Kilkenny around the place. But you just had the thing up about the sweeper. Yeah, yeah, but I, I, still, I still think they'll, you know, I mean, you can... They'll score 27 points. points. Yeah, so they won the, the Leinster final last year, Galway won. I actually can't remember what was in it in the finish, but it was, it was definitely very comfortable. It was seven or eight, yeah. And after yeah. about half an hour, Wexford were just praying for half time. They couldn't keep it them physically. Now, of course, they've come on again, but I think... Also, Galway Wexford scored a couple on. of fluky goals last year in the Leinster final, didn't they? Yeah, D Dermot O'Keefe got a goal. He, he bundled it in yeah. over the line. Everyone was talking about him scoring from wing back last year. He'd, of course, moved to midfield at that point, but... Everyone still says he's <laughs> constantly scoring the back. But there you go. There you go. So, um, does anyone think Wexford are going to win this game? Um, I don't see them winning it. Mm. Um, I think probably being at home will be a huge advantage against playing Galway in Crow Park. Um, the sweeper will try and negate the goal scoring ability of Galway, but Galway are scoring points from all over the park. They can score from anywhere. 
Um, I'm sure Galway at 4-9 to nine will be in the GEA accumulators because I think the favourite backers will look at Galway and look at, as you rightly said, how they brushed aside Kilkenny. Their physical attributes that they have is phenomenal. They're pigs. Every, they are. They're just, but listen, they're tough. And I think even if Wexford give it 110%, it probably won't be good enough. A lot of people are backing Wexford plus four. Though. Yeah, I can see that. I can, I can see know. a Galway win and, and Wexford covering. I think this has the best chance of being the closest game of the weekend just because they're of, of what Wexford are doing. It feels like Wexford have progressed from last year. Like, I wouldn't have given them a few, you know, before the Leinster final last year, the spread should have been much more than four points. I can't remember what it was. But, like, this year you do feel like home advantage has so far proven to be hugely important for the good teams. And Davy Fitz has never lost at home. With I mean, Wexford. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Not in his entire management yeah, career. I was gonna say, Wexford, Jesus, yeah. That's some record. You can imagine. never had to play at home with Waterford. The crowd really. will be up for this too. I mean, there'll be a cracking atmosphere. and um, The players will be up for it. I am, I'm really looking forward to watching it. I think it'll be a cracking game of hurling, but I think Galway will win. But I think Wexford might plus four, come under it. Mm. Not for me. Not, Not for, for you. Me. Uh, Limerick against Cork. Limerick have only beaten Cork 15 times in 65 championship games. This, this is going to be 16. I think so. I think so, yeah. Yeah, I'm with you on that one as well. I, just I just think, think that there's machine. something coming here. And I think that like the flakiness in Cork in the second half was exactly the flakiness that we were concerned about that we thought the first week against Clare they had proven they didn't have. But like, you know, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice. No, it's the other end. You don't fool me no more. <laughs> you have to be disappointed if you're a Cork player to give up a nine-point lead um, against Tipperary. You know, that's got to, you know, it's definitely in the back of your mind going out now against a Limerick team who were very good against Tip. Um, Jer tipped them up to beat Tipperary. Um, I went for Tipperary on that occasion, but I like the odds at 11 to 8. I think it should be a bit closer. I don't see Cork as being a worthy 8 to 11 chance. Yeah, it's a against point Limerick. handicap, isn't it? It is a point. Limerick plus 1 at 11 to 10. But I think if you're fancying Limerick, you're not going to bother with the plus 1. Yeah. I think you're going to go for the 11 to 8. This game could be a draw. It could be very close. I think 9 to 1. If any one of these games are going to be a draw out of the four hurling games, I'd opt for this one, but I do just fancy Limerick to get over the line. That's, why, that's yeah. why the plus one is that's why the plus one's value because you get the draw as well. Yeah. Well, obviously, if you think it's going to be a draw, I take the nine to one. Be interesting <laughs> to see though. Man. They're playing their third week in a row, like as well. Obviously, Tip are as well. And the, and awfully, Limerick had the week off. Yeah, and awfully yeah. had such a disastrous performance last week or three weeks in a row. So it'll be interesting to see our Cork still flying like they were in the first half of the last day. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Then the final hurling game is Tip against Waterford. Surely a handy Tip win here. I wouldn't say handy, but I think surely. I think, I think they'll do. Handy it. Handy <laughs> <tip> <laughs> I know you want a handy tip. <laughs> I think they'll do the business. I, Waterford are just down too much personnel. Yeah. Gle Austin Gleeson could be back, and Park Manny could be back. Could they? They, yeah. they could. They right. could. They could be back, but because all week they're like, no, 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 no. Bit that of poor just mouth, bit of it? Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 in an ideal world, I don't think you want to play them. But this is anything but an ideal world. Die, just yeah. Yeah. like they're they're in bother. I just think as well, uh, on, a, on, a, on a side note, it, I think it'd be so disappointing if Derek McGrath. Rain went down in a whimper like this because they had a, like a, a mass injury list, but that's kind of looking like what's going to happen. Can't can't see them pulling the result out the weekend. No, I mean they're very short. Eight to one on Tipperary just to win the game. Um, I wouldn't go near that. By the way, no, if I was a big no, punter. no, no, no. I know you wouldn't. And like Waterford are six to one, but it goes to show you, as you've just said, Michael, the the injury list. Players probably who who would be starting. But it almost you get the feeling that they're rushing them back just to try and put a bit of respectability on the scoreline. Minus nine, however, I mean, it's, it's, it's a big spread. I'd be hoping that Waterford, for their manager, for themselves, will put it all in here. And Tipperary, yes, it was a good spirited second half performance, but how much of that is Cork's inability to close out the game? I think Waterford plus nine at 10 to 11. What if I told you that the last four championship games that Watford and Tipperary have had, and Watford have had full teams for those games, Tip have averaged 14 point wins? Wow. No? Sorry, I'm going to change my mind. <laughs> I'm going to go Tip minus nine at even money. Jerry, what are you going for? <laughs> the last four, that's the seven goals, that one. Uh, yeah, there's a couple that. of 21 last point four. wins. Monster five final, point big Monster final. Seven point win, yeah. Wow. See, the five and seven point wins are more like, you know, if you take the giant ones that completely skew it, the five and seven point wins. Um, look, I, I, unless the next crop of water for youngsters coming up are as good as the previous ones and they've been for whatever reason not giving them game time like is there any possibility that those young lads that they're going to have to throw in this weekend are absolutely sensational 
not they're, sensational. They're good players. They're good, they players. They're good players, players, but not sensational. And Paddy said earlier that you know last year when they experimented in the league and had a, a hugely youthful team against Galway, they were ten points up and yeah. they collapsed late on. But yeah. there's obviously good hurlers there. Yeah. Yeah. So. But you need to be sensational. I. I. I don't know. I think in this game will be has a big chance of our double winnings. A goal scored inside ten minutes. I think there's going to be plenty of goals in this. Uh, it will be a sweeper though. Contest. It'll be a sweeper with uh, Watford and James it's Callum will have a goal. It's early. Tip's third week mm-hmm. in a row as well. I think uh, that if you're taking the nine points, you're doing it today, and you're hoping that the lads Keith and yeah. Manny plays. In which case, if the part Manny plays, then they're going to score ten or eleven points and freeze. So, like, you'd actually have to wonder then with Ty de Burke out and Dara Fives out, who, who will be the sweeper? Two, who would be the sweepers? Yeah. Does that mean that if Austin Gleeson is fit that he goes into the back line and can they afford to have him in the back line? Maybe so that's his best position. Maybe, maybe he can dominate the game from but there. But their quality of forwards isn't good enough to be able to afford to have him in the back line. That's what my thought At the moment, I would think, yeah. They finished with five of the All-Ireland, the team that started the All-Ireland yeah. On the yeah. team on the pitch last You feel sorry for them because they, they are a good team and yeah. Derek McGrath is hard not to really yeah. like. Uh, looking at the football then, Monaghan for Manor. It's it's a dour sounding fixture. <laughs> I'm up in home at the weekend. Oh, yeah. I'm working. Oh, you poor home, yeah, <laughs> all the hurling. I'm up covering the football. But Monaghan are Monaghan kind of showed himself as I don't know the kind of springers for the All Ireland. I suppose so. It'd no, be interesting not. to follow them. No, they're not. Who uh, locked down Conor McManus, which is obviously very hard to do. Or if he gets injured, Jack McCarron, Conor Did McCarty, the Wiley, Jack McCarron won't start. Vinnie Corey. McCarthy's a good player. Shane oh, he's a good player, yeah. He's yeah. a good footballer. Come on. Uh, I Jerry, you're on my side here, aren't you? Uh, Springers for the All Ireland. Like, they might make a semi final. Springers now. Springer, that means they're a Springer in the yeah. market. Yeah. <laughs> like, they've, they've jumped out already, which they have. I didn't say anything factually incorrect. No, you didn't. No, no. Um, look, you just we, talked waffle and you looked to get away with it. Look, I mean, they beat Tyrone, but where are Tyrone at? I think that's more of a question mark, in, you know, in terms of that game. Um, look, they did put on 118, so they do have scores. Around the park, um, but that's weird, isn't it? They put kicked one eighteen against yeah, their own. one eighteen against their own. So I learned the lessons of last year against Dublin. It's like no, you haven't. No, no, no. That's, that was so all a lot of shite. I suppose you'd respect <laughs> autocratic. I mean, now they're one to six. Yeah, to beat from Anna. Five point spread. Five point spread. Even money. Mm. Um, so Anna conceded seven points. That's the other interesting. Yeah, to Armagh. Armagh. Yeah. Twelve seven against Armagh. Um, Cracker. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> I I I'd be surprised if Monaghan would concede uh, seven points against Armagh. Uh, being totally honest, I think I think Monaghan will win the game. It's up to yourselves if you want to try and get the. Um, that spread's about right, isn't it? Five spread points. is about right, five points. But I wouldn't touch this one with a barge pole because it's so hard to tell. I mean, how often do you even get to see for a man to play? Yeah. So rarely and. Maybe they'll shut up shop. Maybe they won't. Who knows? And they have the two Quigleys up front who could shoot out the lights. And they'll definitely the shut up shop. And Rory Gallagher is a really good manager. And mm. particularly in a situation like this where it's an underdog and he's not coming in facing the ghost of Jim McGuinness every day, writing about him in the Irish Times, bitching about his team selection. So I think that there's a good chance that Fermanagh put it up to Monaghan in a way that they don't have the ego that Tyrone did. It was like, oh, well, you're only, you're only Monaghan. We're going to crush you. Yeah. Like, They'll play cute and I think they'll yeah. stay in the game and I think they'll still be there on the hour mark. It'll just tell Yeah, they'll try and keep it tight, yeah. won't they, for as long as possible. Will, yeah. McMahon has been well backed for first goal score. He's now a five to one chance uh, to score the first goal. Can't score game. goals from the sideline though, can you? No, <laughs> well, if he comes on. Yeah. No, even like the points he got from the sideline. Yeah, well day, that's you know? lucky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um <laughs> the, I'd say chances of maybe not being a goal wouldn't be a bad bet. No goal score, yes. yeah. yeah. Goal with Sligo then. Um I'd say after the way Galway beat Mayo, we're probably all going to say Galway will win this one. But they've won just one of their last four against Sligo in the championship. So anyone giving really? them, anyone giving them a shake here? Sligo, no, no. I mean, it's all. Uh, you know, like obviously uh, Sligo put in tremendous amounts of effort. We we dismissed Sligo one time by saying they had no chance in it and uh, p- proceeded to get very angry phone calls from the management team for weeks afterwards. Um, look. It's a Connacht match, and so therefore Sligo will bring fight. But Galway are cut above most teams in the country at this stage, and they should they should have eight points in hand over teams like Sligo. That's what we expect from this Galway team. Now that's the pressure that they put themselves under by winning games over the last eighteen months. Yeah, I mean, I think they've got to start now delivering a bit of silverware, Galway. Um, no point in beating Mayo and then going on and not winning the Connacht Championship. I think that has to be their primary focus. They'll beat Sligo. They'll beat them. With, it, with plenty in hand, whether they'll cover eight points, um, it's a big spread. Yeah. Um, but I think Galway, they would be a springer 
as in a young side that are coming good. They're playing a good brand of football. Yes, they fell short against Dublin in the league final, but there's, um, I mean, many teams would fall short against Dublin. So they are coming. Um, and good to see Galway having, having a good football team as well as a phenomenal hurling team. But I think they'll win minus eight. I'd be taking Sligo plus eight in this mm. contest. And then Kerry against Clare, there's, I think it's eight points again, is it? It is eight points against Clare. I'd, I'd be looking at Kerry covering this a lot easier than Galway covering eight points against Sligo. Kerry views 37 players in the league. Mm. So he's definitely looking around to see what's out there in the county. Um, are they realistic All-Ireland challengers? Myself and Jer were having a chat about this. They're 5-1 to one to win the All-Ireland and they're 7-1 to one to win Munster and the All-Ireland. I think they'll win Munster. Um, are they good enough yet with this crop of young players? To go all the way this year, I don't think so. But I think they'll be there in the semi-final, without a shadow of a doubt. Um, and I'd fancy Kerry at even money, minus eight, uh, to beat Clare. I think that's 7-1. to one. We were talking about this during the week. Isn't actually the worst of bets at the moment? Because, again, so we were chatting outside. I was asking, like, so say say it's Dublin Kerry in the All-Ireland final. What odds would you get on Kerry in that two-horse race? Considering that they'd have to be shown a bit of form to get there. 9-4? So. to four? I think they'd be shorter. Okay. I think they'd be around about 7-4, to 15-8. Okay. Um, and I think with Kerry and Dublin, I think Kerry have got a bit of a fear now of Dublin over the last couple of years in terms of any time they come up against Dublin, yes, they beat them in the league final, but when it comes to championship, the dubs just seem to have their number. Um, now, that's going to change because it always changed in GEA cycles, but I just think Kerry, Dublin... Um, I'd still fancy Dublin to win. If you think though that um, if you think Kerry are going to win Munster, which more than likely they will, yeah. then they have the easier side of the draw to get to an All Ireland semi final, to get to an All Ireland final. To like, if there's there's no bets really, there's no not that much value to be had in picking the winner of the All Ireland at the moment because everybody thinks Dublin are going to do it. Seven to one about. Uh, if you're sitting on a bet with seven to one in your hand on Kerry to win that All Ireland final, you can lay off on the Dubs. <laughs> enjoy the match. Yeah, you can. Yeah, fine. I was I was down in Ennis last. Can't lay off in boys for so can No, 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 no. No, you can not just yet. Back not yet. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> I was down at Cusack Park last year when uh, Clare pushed pushed Kerry for a half an hour, but and Kerry went down to fourteen men when Donica Walsh was sent off. But Kerry still overwhelmed them physically. They were too strong. Actually, interestingly enough, that was around the time of the Brendan O'Sullivan comeback. He played in the intermediate game just before That's that. Right, yeah. And I was chatting to one of the Kerry subs on the sideline about you know this player and that player. And then Brendan O'Sullivan actually joined in the conversation. And I said to him, geez, I'm surprised you want to talk to the media. And he goes, well, you go away to shitstorm I've had the last few months. <laughs> but anyway, I digress. Oh, but lads, I mean, realistically, Kerry are going to beat Clare and beat them. With plenty to spare. Well, the, the, what, I don't remember what the full time score was last year. 118 oh, to 112, yeah. yeah. Was it 118 yeah, so, to 112? Yeah. Six points. Six points. I, then, I, yeah. I think you're, you're underestimating Clare a small bit now. Division 2 side. Third in Division 2. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Clare are improving a good bit. Um, again, your odds compiler's eight is just teetering between I, I, not, I don't know what to do. Like, yeah. That's, yeah. To be honest. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Maybe it'll be the handicap draw um, on the spread, you yeah. know. Um, which happens. More often than not. Which makes the bookies rich. Yeah, well, I mean, some lads go for the handicap draw. They certainly do, but I think better the weekend for me, um, I think Dublin minus eight. Dublin minus eight, yeah. And to add to that, Ger? Uh, I like Limerick at 11 days. I do too. Uh, I do. There's going to be a draw this weekend. Just, Where's it going to be? Just, uh, you can bat them all, you, in, apart from... The, yeah, you'd still be quid yeah, in. If you have a euro on each one of them, yeah, you could, could still win. I, oh, I'd yeah. say Cork and Limerick is going to be that tight. It's, it's a pint or two either way. I'd, mm. Maybe that's the most likely draw. OK, lads, thanks very much. Leon Blatch from Boyle Thank Sport, Jerry Gilroy, Michael Verney. That's it for the Hurland Show. Uh, don't forget, you can join us every Friday from 12.30pm. We're going to have reporters from all the grounds this weekend, so do follow us on, on the radio as well and off the ball. And from 7pm tonight. Thanks, we'll see you next week.